You are listening to Mining Stock Education, where you'll learn from the top leaders in the natural resource sector and uncover quality mining investment opportunities. I think the opportunity in the senior producers is just about one of the very best I've ever seen. Thanks for tuning in. This is Mining Stock Education. I'm your host, Bill Powers. I'm speaking today with Adrian Day of Adrian Day Asset Management. Adrian Day is a veteran in the gold and resource space. He is a fund manager, and we're going to get his take on the markets. So, Adrian, thanks again for coming on the show. Well, thank you very much for having me, Bill. Let's talk gold major producers. You invest in this category. Can you talk to us about the opportunity you see here, whether good, bad, or medium, in historical perspective, since you've been through previous gold cycles, what is the opportunity in the gold majors right now? Yeah, that's a good question. And and frankly, now, I mean, today, yesterday, gold has pulled back. I, I, I think in the short term, we have a, a good chance of, of a you know, pull back maybe even as much as another hundred dollars. I don't know, but it's it's a short term correction. But we're not talking about yesterday or today, right? I think the opportunity in the senior producers is just about one of the very best I've ever seen. And obviously, the prices are not as low as they've ever been. But when you look at the price of gold you know, 1850 to 1900, which basically is very close to the highs we had back in 1112, 2011-12. And then you look at the valuation metrics. And you can look at more or less, I mean, it's different for each valuation metric, of course, but you can look at price to cash flow, price to free cash flow, price to net asset value, price to, um, you know, EBITDA, EBITDA. Um, You could look at all these different metrics and the senior miners today are in the lowest quartile, by and large, on all of those metrics. That simply does not make sense. Um, the, out, the price of gold is very good. The environment for gold going forward is extraordinarily good, I think. And yet the, the, produ- the senior producers who are or which are Better companies today than they were the last time gold was at 1900. They have less debt. They're not focused on growth at any price. They're not making stupid acquisitions, overpaying for marginal deposits. So much, much better companies today, by and large, and yet the valuations are, are, are so much lower than they were today, and the prices are lower. I don't focus on price because, you know, I think it was Oscar Wilde who talked about people who know the price of everything but the value of nothing. But, but, but in terms of price, you know, the, the XAU would have to double to get back to where it was last time gold was at these levels. So, Bill, it simply does not make sense. And I think... I think there are reasons for it. One reason is that generalists are hesitant about the gold major miners because they've been burned before, maybe once or twice or even three times before. And you know what they say about, you know, fool me once. But so, so I think there's a bit of a reluctance on the part of a lot of uh, generalist managers to get involved in major mining companies. And frankly, there's a lot of other opportunities out there. I'm not talking about Bitcoin. I'm just talking about the stock market. It's doing well. So if you're a money manager, you don't have to be searching around, um, you know, in sectors that you don't really know or understand. But anyway, yeah, I think the I think the opportunity today is 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 extremely compelling. If it's not the generalists rushing into the gold sector yet, um, what do you attribute the fact that Newmont hit an all time high? Even the gold is two hundred dollars off uh, gold's all time high. How do you analyze that? Yeah, well, clearly there are some some generalists, and the generalists that are buying are, I think, without without simplifying too much. I think they're looking at uh, major royalty companies like Franco, and, and you look at Franco, and that's done very well recently. And they're buying Newmont, which is the largest uh, mining company, uh, gold mining company in the world, and it's a U.S.-based company. So for U.S. money managers, you know, that's an easy, easy choice. So I think that's why those companies, in particular, are doing well. Um, 
And of course, you've got the GDX buying. Um, people are buying the GDX retail as well as you know some small institutions, uh, and and they will tend. But 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 individuals and uh, even more institutions, family offices, etc., will tend first of all to go to the big names, obviously. But they haven't gone very that long, very way down the list. Adrian, um, some developers, gold developers that I follow, they seem to be lagging a lot of the other junior gold stocks that I follow. And it's just intuitive as you flip through your finance app every day to see how equities are responding to the gold price. What's your analysis of how the gold developers as a group are performing? And you, could you also put it in historical perspective for us? Well, I think the developers, as well as the smaller producers, are not, are not doing as well at the moment. And I think part of that is because of what I just said, the majors have a newfound discipline. It's not growth at any price. And of course, the COVID lockdown slowed and delayed even those uh, potential m and opportunities that were in the works. So, you know, when you look at the, when you look at the developers as well as the smaller miners, you know, you've got, you've got negatives vis-a-vis the senior miners, typically they are, you know, less diversified. So you've got a single mine company, which obviously has a has a negative compared with a diversified mining company. Offset in that, you always have the possibility of a takeover. But because the takeovers are a little bit behind the eight, you know, I think they're lagging a bit at the moment uh, for various reasons, the newfound discipline and the COVID lockdown. Um, I, you know, you've got the negative without the positive at the moment, but that'll change. Let's talk copper discoveries. There were copper discoveries. You're big on copper, very bullish on copper. Uh, copper hit an all time high recently. Um, in the last cycle, there were copper discoveries that were not developed. And what is your commentary on why they weren't developed? And should investors get excited about maybe some of those previously not developed projects that could get developed in this cycle? Yeah, interesting question. I think there's two things I'd like to say there. One, not just copper, but a lot of a lot of metals in general. Uh, you know, if a if a project is not developed, you know, when copper's at a high or at gold's at nineteen hundred or whatever it is. Sometimes there's a fundamental reason. It might be metallurgy. It can, of course, be politics, which can change dramatically. They can change much more quicker, quicker than metallurgy. But there can be things about a deposit that mean this is not going to be attractive at 2,000 or 2,500, and it's still going to be a difficult project at 3,000. I'm talking gold now. And the same goes for copper. So, so that's one thing to always be aware of when people say we've got this super, super project, we just need higher prices. Yes, of course, that's partly true, but it, it certainly it can be a bit of a sort of excuse, if you like, uh, for a lot of a lot of deposits. The other thing specifically with copper, we've got to remember the lead time on copper. Uh, 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 discoveries, not just a discovery from discovery to, uh, you know, a bankable feasibility, but from a bankable feasibility to actual production, just take that. You've got, you've got a deposit. It's financed or it could be financed. It's got a permit. It's, it's, it's ready, shovel ready, if you like. Um, it's still a long time to build those projects and ramp them up and start producing. And you only have to look at some of the recent recent um, new copper mines to see that, Cobre Panama, for example, um, Wayotogo, for example, which was rushed, but, but still it takes many, many, many years. And the point is that for a copper company, putting often billions of dollars into development, they don't really care what the price of copper is today. They want to know that that price of copper is going to still be high in five or seven years when they're producing. And if it's a 20 or 30 year mine life, 
They want some expectation of the price over the long term. So, you know, copper deposits typically, you don't see a huge rush of copper deposits being developed just when copper has a one year price increase. Um, because, well, for the reasons I, I just said. And just to put in perspective what I, what I indicated about length of time, you know, um, this was last year, admittedly, but uh, Atkinson, Rod Atkinson, the, uh, um, uh, uh, the CEO of uh, Freeport, he, he was talking about how, you know, they weren't, they weren't planning on developing any other uh, projects at the moment. And, uh, you know, they had a good portfolio. They had diversified portfolio. They'd just done some expansions. And someone asked him the question, well, if you change your mind, you know, how long would it take before you could start producing from some of these deposits that you've got? And the guy, you know, named off three or four. And Atkinson said, you know, we probably got five or seven shovel-ready deposits. Shovel-ready is how he described them. But if the board of directors gave the go-ahead tomorrow, it would be five to seven years before they were producing. That's pretty astonishing. Point I'm making is it takes a long time for these things to produce. So a one-year spike in the price doesn't do it. Adrian, do you think that the dynamic that you just described there, that long lead time to put a copper mine into production, coupled with the left wing political movement that we're seeing in South America, which is talking about taxing the copper miners and making things more onerous for them. Is this all bullish for the copper price on a per pound basis? <laughs> yeah, I think it's very, very bullish. Um, again, you, you know, Seasoned, seasoned directors, seasoned, seasoned directors, but seasoned management of the large copper mining companies, they know that this is a cyclical business. And they know that just as the price is cyclical, so are the politics cyclical. Um, you know, things change. And uh, the market's darling one year, you know, elects a left-wing guy, but in five or seven years' time, it's, it's, it's back on the you know, conservative or whatever you want to call it, a uh, trade. So things change, things are cyclical. But again, that emphasizes that the guy, the, the management wants some sense of longer term stability. Uh, you know, what we're seeing, um, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to exaggerate it too much. I mean, the, the proposals that came out of the Chilean Congress were just, frankly, you know, preposterous because mines can't operate with, you know, 40 and 50% royalties, obviously. There, there, there is such a thing as costs, um, which some people seem to forget. But, but those proposals are not going to be, that's not going to be the final, the final enactment. We're, go, we're going to get higher taxes, probably a royalty. Um, governments around the world have discovered royalties uh, as a preferred way to, to taxes as you tax on profits, a royalty can be off the top. Um, similarly in Peru, you know, there was a lot of rhetoric from, um, uh, from what's his name, at the beginning of the campaign, you know, we're gonna nationalize the mines. Oh, well, wait a minute, we're only gonna nationalize the foreign mines. Oh, well, we're not actually gonna nationalize them, we're just gonna to wanna to own half of them or three quarters of them. So the rhetoric, you know, gets uh, uh, moderated as you get close to the election. And the truth of the matter is that even if he is declared the eventual winner and becomes a president, he doesn't control Congress. He does not control Congress. Uh, you know, all the dozens of parties that they have in Peru, they all have a few seats in that Congress, and he does not control it. So, yes, there'll be higher taxes, um, but but you won't see the kind of extreme measures, I don't think, not in Peru. I don't think, at the moment, I don't think Peru is moving towards Venezuela by any means. 
Dore Copper Mining is a premier, near-term, high-grade copper and gold redevelopment opportunity with tremendous exploration potential only 14 kilometers from the town of Shibugamu in mine-friendly Quebec. Dore Copper is debt-free and owns a 2,700-ton-per-day mill with an 8-million-ton tailings facility ready to be used. There is already power to site and it is accessible by paved highway and rail. Dore Copper aims to produce a profitable hub-and-spoke operation of over 100,000 gold equivalent ounces per year or over 60 million pounds of copper equivalent by 2024. Because of the existing infrastructure and location, a low capex is anticipated to recommence production. Dore Copper trades under DCMC in Toronto and under DRCMF on the OTC. To learn more, go to DoreCopper.com. That's DoreCopper.com. Adrian, I read an article recently in a financial publication uh, laying out a bullish uh, view in the next few years for oil. And a lot of it had to do with being a result of the green movement, where the green movement has taken away money from oil exploration. And then also, uh, you know, that has going to produce maybe a supply side shortage, which could push the oil price up and also the expectations of transitioning to a carbon free economy you know, is not very realistic, at least in the time frame that they're talking about. And this could be bullish for oil. Uh, would you concur with that viewpoint or what would you add? Oh, 100%. I'd add a couple of things. Um, what, what you just said is true, not just for oil, but in general terms is also true for copper and nickel and, and steel. I mean, the green movement seems to forget that in order to have a green vehicle, or in order to have an offshore windmill, or in order to have a charging station, all of these wonderful, wonderful green things, you need copper and nickel and steel and oil. You need these things. And they seem to have forgotten that. And so a copper, for example, an electric vehicle, as you probably know, an electric vehicle uses five times as much copper as an a internal combustion engine car. So we're talking about a big increase, which is part of a reason, of course, that copper and nickel have gone up. I would, I'm less bullish on, on oil. The argument's the same, but I'm less bullish on oil than I am on, say, copper and nickel, because there is, uh, there is excess supply. You know, we... We could, I mean, Saudi Arabia has excess supply. Um, Russia has supply. You know, we don't want to buy them from the nasty Ruskies, but they have excess supply. And of course, in a different political environment, you know, we could, we could start producing and exporting oil again, as we were in, in, in the last year, 2019, before COVID. So there is excess supply in a way that there isn't with copper, for example. Uh, you, you, as I just mentioned, you couldn't just, you, you couldn't just say, well, let's boost our copper, our copper production, you know, three months later, it's there. That could happen with oil, it could happen with uranium, for example. So I'm less bullish on those than I am on the ones that have a genuine shortage as well as increased demand. But yeah, what you're saying is 100% true, and it, it sort of, if I may, I, I, I don't want to get political, but it was a comment that President Biden made. Uh, it was one of his offhand comments, which are usually more, more interesting than the, than the teleprompter comments. But he said something about, we don't really want more mining in the United States. We'll buy our metals and oil from our allies. Well, you could unpack, as they say in college, you could unpack that sentence. There's a lot going on in there. But one of the things that's going on is saying, well, we want clean air. We don't want the emissions. But our allies abroad, let them have dirty air. It doesn't matter. But at least it's a, an acknowledgement that you need these increased supplies of metals in order to have green energy, in order to have infrastructure spending, et cetera, et cetera. Adrian, uh, like you said, it's not a political show, but as investors, we have to deal with policies that our politicians uh, call law. And it's being talked, higher taxes, getting rid of carried interest for fund managers such as yourself, 
you know, a guest on my show recently said he feels like it's uh, an impediment for the little man trying to work his way up out of the middle class and truly generate wealth. And I agree with that. Um, what is your thoughts with your experience? You're an immigrant to the United States. Now you're in Puerto Rico. <laughs> but uh, just share with us your thoughts, please. Yeah, look, 100 there, percent. There's, oh, We could talk all day about this. If you give me a glass of wine, I would talk all day. And you can turn the camera off anytime you want. <laughs> but, you know, when, when people talk about, oh, the rich need to pay their fair share, first of all, of course, you know, the top 10 percent are paying most of the income taxes today anyway. But but we always focus on, you know, people like Buffett and Bill Gates, people who already have the wealth and Bloomberg. Let's get a left winger in there. Well, I miss, I guess Gates and Buffett are left wing enough. So Bezos is left wing, um, too, I think. Sorry? Uh, Bezos, Washington Post. Yeah, 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 yeah. Funny that, isn't it? Anyway, um, back to the point. We always talk about the people who have extreme wealth. What And your other guest, what about the person trying to create wealth? Can you just imagine if you go to work at 22 or 23 years old and you earn X over 40 years and you're taxed, you're, you're taxed at 50% income tax when you have, or more, when you live in Maryland, California, New York, probably Michigan, I'm not quite sure, to be honest, but several of the big high, high, high tax states, and you pay Social Security, and you run your own business, so your Social Security is 15%, add all that up, you're paying 55 to 60% of your earnings in tax. Compare that with the person living in, let's just say, Hong Kong, with the same salary, the same salary, but paying 10% income tax over 40 years. The difference in wealth at the end of that is tremendous. And those are the people we should be talking about, the people trying to make it. Forget about the people who have hundreds of billions of dollars. It doesn't matter to them. You know, in fact, they normally welcome it, as you know. And my answer to, to people like Buffett is, if you want to pay more taxes, go ahead and pay, because I'm not stopping you, and I know the Treasury will accept your check. So go ahead and pay more, but don't make other people pay, people who are trying to get ahead. So that's, that's one aspect. The other aspect, of course, is that we all know that, you know, Laffer, Art Laffer, with his Laffer curve, showed it very, very simply on, on the back of a napkin. Remember 40 years ago on the back of a napkin. But when you increase taxes you don't get a proportional increase in revenue. We know that. And you increase capital gains tax to 43% or whatever, it's not gonna happen, but you increase it to 43% and you live in a state like New York or Maryland that also taxes you on, on capital gains, you're almost a 50%, which is not indexed to inflation. So you're paying 50% on phantom gains, People aren't going to just sit around and say, well, okay, take my 50%, it's fine. They're going to do something about it. And that might mean selling in advance of, of the thing, or it might mean restructuring. Remember how we kept, for, for 40 years, I mean, I remember when I edited a tax newsletter back in the 1970s, I didn't know anything about tax. I was just the editor, you know, other people wrote it. But the big thing always was, you got to convert ordinary income into gay, into capital income. You've got to convert. Well, now people will just say convert capital back. People will always find a way to try to minimize those tax hikes. So, you know, the thought that, well, we're going to increase capital gains from what is it now? 20 percent? I don't know. I'm uh in Puerto Rico. Yeah, you Puerto are. Rico, we don't pay capital gains. What it, is it? It's like, yeah, that? like 20% for long term over a certain amount. And then I got to yeah. pay state tax on top of that. You increase from 20% to 43%, you're not going to more than double the taxes. It's just not going to happen. And you're also going to get more people moving to Puerto Rico, frankly. Um, so is that the only answer, Puerto Rico, for an American? That, <laughs> I mean, what's the other answer? Or is that it? Oh, well, for an American. I mean, the first answer, of course, is to give up your citizenship. And if you don't want to give up your citizenship, basically, uh, you know, Puerto Rico, Virgin, U.S. Virgin Islands, or Guam are the only three places where you can be a U.S. citizen without, and without having to pay the IRS. They're the only three places. 
and and Puerto Rico, of course, has a program to to attract Americans uh, with with favorable tax rates, and it's a nice place. Um, I'm not saying Virgin Islands or Guam aren't nice, if anyone from there is listening, but. Uh, you know, Puerto Rico is a nice place and they have a program to attract people, but they're the only places where an American can move and and not be sub, still subject to the IRS. And just think about that for a second, Bill. You see, your wish, you never ask me the question now. <laughs> you're you're, you're on fire. <laughs> well, just think about this for a second. The U.S. has the audacity to claim, but if, let's just say me, if I, a British citizen who was born in England, if I go back to England or I move to anywhere I want, but let's just say I move back to America, I, uh, to England, I retire in America, I work in, in, in England, I work in England and all my income is from England and I never have any intention of coming back to the U.S. again, the U.S. claims they still have the right to tax me. And if I want to give up my uh, permanent residence in order to stop that, they claim the right of an exit tax. Now, do you know what countries normally or what, what political systems normally have exit taxes? It's tyrannical systems. It's the Soviet Russians had an exit tax and the Nazis, of course, had an exit tax on Jews, who, Jewish people who wanted to leave. You know, if, if, the, if the US system was introduced by Russia today, We'd all be pointing fingers saying, you know, how, how, how atrocious it is that they won't let their people leave. That's exactly what the U.S. is doing today. And I know it, it, doesn't, it takes a village and all that kind of garbage. But, um, Hillary, I'm sorry. It's not your money. <laughs> yes. Anyway. So, but, no, one more question on that, Adrian, just as we conclude. Carried interest. Because you're a money manager and you can benefit from carried interest. And for listeners that don't know what that is, you're basically charged as you manage money and, and you make money as the money manager, you're charged at the capital gains rate, which is can be significantly less than the average income, general uh, income rate. Well, that actually did not apply to me just because of the way we were set up, but it applies to a lot, particularly hedge fund managers and so on. It, it applies to a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts on that? You know, the argument is it's not equitable for everybody else. Well, it's an unfair advantage. Well, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've always thought that if something is not equitable, let's not focus on making it worse for the people taking advantage of it. Let's try to focus on making it better for everyone else. You know, you get, um, oh, it's not fair, but uh, this online business, you know, based in Florida isn't paying tax in, in Maryland and there is unfair competition against the brick and mortar stores. Well, let's talk about cutting taxes for the brick and mortar stores. Let's not always talk about raising taxes for other people. I agree. And we'll leave it at that. That's a, okay. that's a good point. Adrian's website is adriandayassetmanagement.com. I love bringing Adrian on the show every three months. Really appreciate your insights, Adrian, and thank you for contributing to my show. Well, thank you very much, Bill. And you learned your lesson. Don't ask me <laughs> we, questions about tax. We won't talk tax next time. Just gold <laughs> stocks and resource investing. <laughs> okay. Thank you for having okay, me. Cheers. Cheers.